Well, before we start, I tell you our taping so we can capture Martin McIntyre's presentation for any of you or for anybody else who missed this class. So we can have it on DVD if anybody would like to have it. We'll leave it in the library as well. So now we start officially. It's five o'clock. So good evening or good afternoon if you like. My name is Wafiq Wabi. And uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Mori Twusi to give us uh, his class, your students. And uh, let me see by a show of hand, how many of you have been to Martin McIntyre's uh, class last week? Uh, last, okay, very good. Or last year. Last year, okay. last year, very good. Okay. How many of you have been to the plant in Olsip in Chicago? Very good, okay. Now, the, the plan would be like this. Today we'll get the theoretical background and the fun here on the screen and from Marty. And then on the 13th of October, we'll take two vans or three vans and go and visit a plant. Um, and we'll talk about this later. And Dr. Tusi will uh, give you the details so we can see uh, how things are done in the plant. And maybe you can visit some project, projects. So without much ado, Marty McIntyre, and she will introduce herself. OK. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I thought I recognized a couple of you from last year, but um, I work with PCI, which is the Precast Pre-Stress Concrete Institute. Um, it's kind of a combination of a trade association, so um, we have about 235 member companies who manufacture precast products, anything from bridge beams, hollow core, double T's, any of the large structural type pieces of concrete that you would see coming to a job site on a truck. So no small lintels and nothing that goes underground. Um, we're also an institute, which means we do a lot of work with uh, universities doing um, uh, research, project, product development, and um, kind of state of the industry um, uh, work to, to kind of keep things up to speed. So um, this is gonna be a review for some of you who've seen this already, but I just have a little bit of information for you that gives you uh, kind of a nice introduction to um, precast. We're gonna talk a little bit about what are the um, products that are manufactured, where are they used, and how, is it, how are they um, manufactured. So feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions, and um, I'd be happy to answer your questions for you. I always think when I'm starting to talk about precast that in some ways it's kind of fun to um, look at kind of the biggest or the best or the most um, interesting projects that have been done. So. Um, over the last year, I kind of put together, this is my own personal list of what I call the seven wonders of precast, some of the projects that I think are some of the coolest uh, precast projects that are out there. And that's kind of a, a nice way for me to get started. So you can see that they're all over the world, but of course I know more projects in the U.S. than anywhere else, so a lot of them are, are right here in our own back door. Oops, oh, it didn't like getting transferred, I apologize. Uh, so this is uh, supposed to show you the Baha'i Temple. I can show you another picture of it. Uh, it's up here in the corner. Sorry about that. I don't know why it didn't, um, didn't transfer. Um, so the Baha'i Temple is in Glencoe, Illinois, up north of um, Chicago, kind of near the uh, lakefront on Lake Michigan. And it was actually done in the 1920s uh, through the 1930s. It took quite a while to build. And the entire skin of it is actually architectural precast. It was manufactured in New York and then shipped piece by piece to uh, Glencoe. And um, you can see on the dome and in some of the other areas, and if you could see the pictures that I had put on my slide, you'd be able to see that. Some of the intricate detail that you can actually get out of architectural precast. Um, then those are all put together and it can really withstand the test of time. So um, it's, it does a nice job doing that. In some ways, manufacturing, uh, yes? Would you please give us your definition of precast? Uh, the definition of precast. What precast means? Um, you know, precast is anything that's cast in a plant and then brought to the to the site. So it's cast out of um, concrete, um, and usually it's manufactured in some kind of formwork. In the case of the Baha'i Temple, it's specially designed formwork with all of those intricate details. 
Um, actually, all of these would be specialty, specialty things. But it can also be um, kind of more mundane, double T's, hollow core, different pieces like that that are cast in steel beds where you repeat the same pattern or the same piece over and over again. So it's really, precast is really manufactured at the plant and then brought uh, to the job site. So in some ways with architectural precast and what happened with the Baha'i Temple, Precast has not changed a whole lot. You, if you had a client who was willing to pay that much money, put that much money into it, you could still get that kind of architectural precast in that same level of detail. I don't see a whole lot of clients looking for that, but that could happen. The things that have really changed in our industry since that was done in the 1920s and 30s is really the quality of the concrete that's being used. Um, there's admixtures now that allow a much higher strength concrete to be used. Um, there's self-compacting concrete, which allows the concrete to flow and to get into a lot of um, nooks and crannies a little bit better. And um, just the whole idea of repetition in the industry, that, that's one of the first examples of architectural precast. And now, you know, uh, 50, 100, uh, 50, 75 years later, it's become an industry and uh, you know it's just a much more common product than it was then. Um, I, don't know my, I don't know why my, my picture, it doesn't like my pictures. Um, the, second, um, the second program or program, the second project um, that I like to talk about is the channel. Um, in a lot of ways, this is um, just as uh, interesting. It might not be as beautiful to look at as the Baha'i Temple, but the, just the scope of the project and the magnitude of what they were able to do with the precast is really remarkable. They, uh, the entire tunnel or the tunnel underneath the English Channel is lined in precast. And they actually had to use two different designs for the precast on the two different sides of the channel because of the soil conditions. And so they really had to look at the soil conditions and design the precast around it. So um, the, all of the liner components, they tr uh, augured every, all of the dirt out of it and then placed the liners in there and created the, the channel underneath the channel. Um, so the Sunshine Skyway Bridge is kind of interesting because it's a five mile long bridge and uh, it was really an engineering feat that kind of combines the two things that we were looking at earlier. It's the, the engineering of the, the channel and uh, the magnitude of that project, but it's got some of the same beauty, I think, that uh, the Baha'i Temple has, that it really was able to kind of take the product and, and use it in a very organic way to, to make it beautiful and functional at the same time. So that was done uh, in the 1980s, and at that time it was the longest bridge um, and the first of its type. The Jubilee Church is in Rome. Uh, Richard Meyer was the architect. Um, he is actually a New York architect. This is a, a Catholic church um, in Rome, and Richard Meyer loves very bright, white, clean spaces. And uh, the Jubilee Church um, really reflects his uh, love of that kind of starkness and the, the whiteness. The interesting thing about it, I think, is really where you are able to take the precast and use it as a curved product, a molded product, a very flowable um, look. Um, unfortunately, you can't see the picture of the inside of the church, but the inside of the church is also very bright and white. Some of the things that make this one of my seven wonders include that look of the church that looks kind of like a sail and that it has that ability to come in different shapes, um, but they've still managed to use some repetition here. You'll see that they've repeated the same shapes in the three um, sails or three surfaces. And the other thing that's really interesting about this project is the bright whiteness of the, the concrete. They actually used an admixture that's available from an Italian company that uh, is a self-cleaning concrete. So now uh, they won't have to go back and clean this uh, material over and over again. It'll stay bright and white like this. 
The other thing that that admixture does is allow the um, concrete to absorb CO2. So it actually cleans the air around it. Um, we've only seen it used on one project so far in the US. I think it's still kind of expensive, but I think it's one of the ways that we'll see concrete changing in the future. It's not something that's just used for um, precast. You can use it really for any kind of concrete. But uh, you know, I think that's just a really beautiful example of uh, new technology. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the back, please, back one slide. Back one slide. Yep. Any idea if these uh, three uh, bending parts are hollow or uh, kind of a shell of some sort? Um, I believe, th no, they are not. They're about, um, I think they're about eight inches thick. Okay. So, yeah. Just one solid thing. Yeah, they're, okay. they're solid panels. Okay. I believe they're structural as well as being okay. radius. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna go back so we can look. I've never had this happen before. So we can look at the Sydney Opera House. I always think that it's kind of interesting to look at this, which is a very modern example of precast concrete. And, and really, you can look back at the Sydney Opera House up on the top. All of those, uh, the white components that look like sails, those are all precast concrete. It's on a steel frame. Um, uh, Jorn Utzen was the name of the um, architect on that project and uh, he designed this. It was a design competition. He kind of snuck the design in at the last minute and um, they had picked something else but then when they saw this they, they said no we have to have this opera house and that's really great but the technology was not there at the time to build it. So then there were all sorts of delays and what he finally figured out was he was going to be able to make it affordable and make it happen by keeping that radius exactly the same for all of those different panels and to create a lot of repetition even without having one piece be exactly the same as, as the other. So he kind of played on the radius um, to, to create those different sails. Um, it was one of the first projects to really use um, building information modeling and computers, uh, computer-aided design. And uh, it was very controversial because it kept having delay after delay after delay. And um, finally, uh, the architect got kicked off the, the project and he never saw the finished project. You could, it's such an interesting story, you could make a movie out of the um, out of the creation of the Sydney Opera House. But again, just kind of one of, the, uh, uh, one of the seven wonders because it really kind of did something completely new with precast concrete. The Transamerica Tower is um, in San Francisco and it's the tallest architecturally precast clad building um, in the U.S. And uh, some of the things that make it really interesting include that they had to be able to, um, you know, put it up uh, with architectural precast and clad the exterior in some place that, you know, it's going to have to have high seismic uh, uh, zone, in a high seismic zone. So that was kind of interesting as well. They wanted something that, you know, they could keep clean and uh, neat and uh, did it with, the, with precast concrete. Another early example of architectural precast. Kozai is a little bit closer to <coughs> home. It's in Columbus, and it's the um, uh, Columbus uh, 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 Museum of Science and Industry. And uh, 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 Arata is Izozaki is a Japanese architect, and he was the one who designed it. And again very organic in the way that he used concrete as a very flowable material and actually you know, used that ability to curve and shape it. Each one of these pieces, you can kind of see the people are right here. So each one of these pieces is 60 feet tall and about um, 10 feet wide. Um, it was cast all in one piece in specialty forms and then uh, the precaster who did it have, had to create specialty trucks to cart it to the job site. They had to create specialty forms for it and uh, had to be very careful with all of the handling and erection of uh, this piece because uh, you, know, you can't pick up 
a piece of precast in the middle because it, it's actually more fragile than you think it would be. It can just break into two. So they had to be very careful about uh, handling and, and erecting this, this project. And there's some, just some examples of uh, what it looked like when they were handling it. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of my fun part, uh, and I apologize that the pictures didn't translate. Um, anybody got any questions about anything you've seen so far? No. All right. Well, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, when I talk about precast products, sometimes I like to think about music as well. So here I've got my George Handel, who's one of my favorites and Metallica, who I also like. And I love thinking about uh, precast the same way I think about music, because you're taking these two very diverse types of music. Uh, you probably, in a lot of ways, wouldn't think of uh, those two uh, groups or a composer in that group in the same uh, light. But when you think about it, they're using all of the same notes. They're creating the music using the same scale, the same 12 notes, the same keys on a piano, and that's the same thing that's happening with precast concrete. So I always like to think about it that way. Um, really what that shows is all of the different pieces of precast flying in and, and coming together. It's all the cool stuff. I, I wanted to kind of take you through the, the notes on the scale or the, the keys on the piano as, in terms of what ha happens in uh, the precast industry. And that would be what, common pr what the products are that are commonly used. So probably the most common product that you're going to see is hollow core. Hollow core comes in widths of two feet, four feet, and eight feet, but it's typically going to be four feet long, and it can be anywhere from six inches deep to 16 inches deep. But usually you're going to see a piece of uh, hollow core that is four feet wide and 10 to 12 inches deep. And then it's got these cores that are cast in the middle of it. So who can tell me why they think the cores are cast? in the middle of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's, that's it exactly. Because you get the strength of the concrete and you can combine that with um, the uh, strength of steel that you're doing the pre-stressing with. And you don't need all that extra weight. Weight is going to be one of the downfalls for precast concrete. Yeah. Oh, yes. He said for, to decrease the weight of the um, of the pieces, which was exactly right. So, 
It is also the saving of materials, but um, for the most part, it's, it's the weight because weight is going to be your one thing that you want to watch out for with, or one of the things that you're going to want to watch out for with, with precast concrete. Um, it, you can manufacture it in a couple of different ways. One is a wet cast method where you have a pretty typical kind of wet uh, mix of concrete. You put um, hoses in the forms that kind of look like fire hoses. The, you place the concrete on top of it as the concrete cures. You pull those whole, the, the hoses out of it and you end up with those cores. The other way is you can use an extruded method and with that, um, the precast is, or the concrete is very dry. And uh, it actually comes out of a machine. I always liken it to a tube of toothpaste, where you're kind of pushing the, the concrete out. Concrete might be about the, the same consistency as toothpaste as well. And you might have augers working in there. And that's going to create the openings in it. And uh, with that dry mix, you can almost walk on it immediately. So that's a couple different areas that you can manufacture it in. Hollow core usually is going to be about 30 feet long. And uh, we see a lot of it used for hotels, motels, uh, single family, um, condominiums, schools, any place where you want to get a nice long span and any place that uh, fire safety is going to be an issue. It can be a really good product in, in any of those cases. Double T's, they're called double T's because that's what they look like, two T's right next to each other. Um, double T's have two parts of the, the product. The first part is your top surface that goes across the top of the T's, and that's going to be called your flange. Your flange is usually going to be about 12 feet wide. Um, sometimes we have 15 foot wide, but usually it's going to be 12 feet wide. And then you'll have the two stems coming down, the two, the two uh, stems of the T. And um, those are usually going to be about 18 inches deep. And then you're going to have a piece of precast that's generally 60 feet long and um, 12 feet wide but you can go up to about 110 feet long with this. So we see this used a lot for parking decks. That's really the number one thing that you see it used in. You also see it used for um, the other building that I have down there is a convention center um, where you might have heavier loads on the floor, um, uh, swimming pools, uh, any kind of, some condominium buildings will use them where you need longer spans. So this is generally uh, longer spans and a little bit heavier duty floor product than you would get with the, um, with the hollow core. Architectural precast, this is what you're going to see um, when you visit ALSIP. And architectural precast really um, starts to be where you have um, a lot more color, texture. Um, usually it's a cladding product on the exterior of a building. Um, you can have uh, color integrated right into it. You're going to start to have your curved pieces. Um, you're going to start to have more uh, decorative detail added to it. And these are usually cast in wooden forms rather than in steel forms. So uh, you will have some repetition with them. But uh, usually, you're going to have form work that's uh, built specifically for that particular building. Then you can also have wall panels. Uh, wall panels can still have a little bit of uh, decorative, um, uh, decorative um, pieces to them. But it, in most cases, um, rather than having the color integrated right into it, you're going to stain over the concrete. So both of the yellow and the, the blue are both stained right into there. Uh, sometimes we see people just leave the concrete right exposed, like you see here. But uh, these are usually cast in what our industry calls long line beds. And so those beds can be um, 150 feet long. And they cast multiple pieces all at the same time. So um, usually not as much uh, decorative detail added to those. Then you can also have structural products. Um, those would be uh, columns, beams, um, inverted T-beams, any kind of structural wall panels, things like that. 
and um, that can be the entire structure and frame of a building. Typically, uh, when you're using um, precast as the structural system, we see it usually used anywhere from two stories to about 11 or 12 stories would be typical. Um, there is a project in California that goes 22 stories. That's about as high as it's gone. But, um, you know, we see a lot of um, 8 to 12 story uh, structures done in, in structural precast. We also have modular construction. Uh, that's in the, this case, it's a prison. Um, that's probably the most popular use for it, where you've got the prison cells. And um, one of the reasons that this is so popular for the prisons is it can all be done off-site. So they add the furniture, the communications equipment, the safety equipment, all at the precaster site. They bring it out to the job site. They stack them, one right on top of the other. And uh, in this case, they've got the two prison cells, and then they've got a lip coming out for a walkway. Um, we don't see a whole lot of prisons being built in uh, Illinois right now, considering we have one sitting empty. Um, but, um, but for a while, that was being done. The interesting thing about these is the whole idea of modularity is really being carried into a lot of different uh, products as well, the wall panels and um, uh, floor systems. I'm starting to see uh, more things being added at the precast plant. So the electrical conduit and boxes are being cast right in, uh, holes for the plumbing being cast right in. So a lot of that is happening at the, the manufacturer site rather than happening at the job site. And uh, that's something that a lot of insurance companies like because they feel it's a more controlled environment. And then um, we also do a lot of transportation products. In Illinois, the three biggest transportation products, well, four really, uh, bulb tees, um, like you see going across, um, box beams, those are usually for shorter bridges. They're empty, box or they're, they're hollow boxes. Usually they have like a styrofoam piece in the middle um, with four sides of concrete around it. The bulb tees are shaped kind of like this with a bulb on the, the bottom. Um, sound wall up in the um, Chicago area, there's quite a bit of sound wall. And then also uh, retaining wall systems. So those are the biggest transportation products that we see. Yes? Uh, he was asking what sound wall is. Sound wall is um, uh, a wall system that you would see on the side of a highway. So usually it's some kind of decorative concrete piece about 12, of, uh, about 8 inches thick. Uh, you see it in more densely populated urban areas where they don't want the sound of the highway going to the homes on either side or the businesses on either side. So we see a lot of that up, up north, not so much down here. So that's kind of the, the typical products. Um, that you see with precast concrete. Does anybody have any questions about any of the products that you've seen? Mm -mm. Okay. I got, I got oh, yeah. On several of the buildings, like uh, where they were occupied buildings, uh, I'm assuming that some of that is the hollow floor with some kind of insulation proper unit. Oh, I'm sorry. On the, on, for the walls? Or yes, the for floors? the exterior. For, Primarily for the exterior walls, your yeah, yeah. Some of them not not so they don't use in this part of the country. We don't see a whole lot of hollow core being used for the wall systems. In Wisconsin, we do see that sometimes. So I, it's really a matter of what's available locally. Um, but yeah, you can put insulation right into the the wall panels. Um, it depends on what you're using it for. That starts to make it a little bit more expensive. So a lot of times you'll put up the, the concrete system and then put the insulation and then put the drywall over it if you're going to drywall it. But if you're not going to drywall over it, uh, you can put the insulation right in the middle of it. Anything else? Well, I thought I would just show you some projects just so you can see what uh, typical projects look like with uh, precast. Um, we do a lot of uh, athletic facilities, um, the risers beams, raker beams, the exterior systems. We see a lot of this thin brick 
being added right to the precast wall panel so you get a lot of decorative finishes that way but uh, we see a lot of those um, a lot of schools are uh, using precast these days whether they be just the gymnasium with a steel uh, form or a steel structure on the interior with uh, with precast wall panels around it or decorative pieces um, Centralia High School just did a, a really nice high school out of precast. A lot of healthcare facilities. In the healthcare market, we see more of the exterior skin um, on the cladding products being used. Um, some designers feel like there's vibration issues that uh, they want to stay away from with the, with the structural system. Although I have seen it used um, successfully in uh, structural systems used successfully in healthcare as well. Industrial facilities, uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what happened. Um, but industrial facilities, a lot of warehouses, food facilities, things like that. We see a lot of those used. I don't even remember what that picture looked like. Uh, municipal buildings, we see a lot of um, every, well, lately, all, half of my members seem to be working on water um, systems, water reclamation projects. That seems to be one of the few um, building types that's still going up these days. Um, but a lot of municipal buildings, anywhere where the tenant's going to be there for a long time and starts to really look at uh, the long-term cost effectiveness of uh, using insulated wall panels, for instance. Another question? Yes. Uh, the Previous screen, uh, the building to the right, uh, these walls are structural or pure architectural? Right here? Yes, and the so, shell? Yes, those are actually structural wall panels. Um, so uh, it's a, what our industry likes to call a total precast building, um, which means that the, the, it's got precast columns and beams. You can see the double T floors, and then the exterior wall panels are also structural, um, so they have eliminated all the perimeter structural framing. Office buildings. Uh, this is the FBI building in Chicago. So one of the interesting things that we've been doing a lot of research on recently is blast resistant design. We've been working with the um, US Air Force on blast resistant, and that seems to be a hot topic with a lot of government buildings ever since Oklahoma City. Um, uh, that seems to be a key element. Uh, one of the other interesting things, this is a building actually in Milwaukee where they took all the cladding off and they wanted to save the office building, so they reclad it in architectural precast, and that's another trend that I've seen quite a bit of. And then a lot of uh, residential um, multifamily housing. Uh, not a lot of people are building that this year, but in past years we, we've seen precast use for that quite a bit. And then transportation products. Um, this is kind of interesting. This, this bridge here is uh, going over the Des Plaines River on the new leg of I-355. Um, and uh, the, the uh, beams going across there were 176 feet long. So it, that one of the great things about that is it really shows you how long you can get with um, precast concrete. They really were trying to be very careful about um, uh, putting anything into the, to the river and disturbing the habitat of a dragonfly that, that was there. So they had to have these long beams and, and uh, not disturb the habitat. And they went to a lot of expense and trouble to, to create this bridge. And then it turns out that where the bridge casts a shadow, the dragonflies won't fly there anyway. So it uh, ended up kind of being for naught. But it did prove that you can go 176 feet with precast bridge beams. And then probably one of the most common uh, types of products that you're going to, or projects that you're going to see with um, precast projects are, products are, I uh, can't get it straight today, are going to be parking decks. Um, you know, that 60 foot long double T um, that'll give you, um, you know, a couple of bays of parking and uh, you can do decorative finishes on the exterior. You can
can do simple finishes on the exterior. I just did a seminar yesterday on the history of the, the parking deck. And uh, it's uh, kind of interesting to see that the, it's kind of turning. They used to look a lot like buildings. And then for a while, they were very kind of simple gray boxes. And now it's kind of turning back. And now they're all looking like buildings again. So that's kind of interesting. So um, that's really typically where we see it, um, see the project products being used. You guys have any questions about the projects? OK. Well, I thought I would finish up by showing you a uh, plant tour. This video will explain the entire process of producing a pre-stressed concrete unit at a pre-stressing plant, in this case, a double T. A double T is used primarily in parking structures, but can be used in virtually any type of building, including office buildings, industrial buildings, and schools, to name a few. Double T's are kind of a unique product with uh, having a capability of having a very long span. When you start talking long spans, uh, you're talking 60 feet plus and sometimes goes as high as 120 feet. The typical day of a pre-stressing plant usually starts very early in the morning. The product from the previous day's casting has cured by now and the pieces need to be stripped from the form to get ready for today's casting. For any pre-stressing plant, it is very important to maintain a clean plant. Maintaining neatness is not only positive from an image standpoint, but also from a safety standpoint, since any debris that might be left over from the day before could create a tripping hazard or other safety problem. The first part of the process is setting up of the form. A thorough cleaning of the entire form is done with basic labor and appropriate cleaning equipment. Setting the side forms, or in the case of a typical double T, the forms may be fixed forms with an appropriate draft to allow for easy stripping. Once the bed is cleaned, it's ready for setting up today's cast. This particular bed is set up for five double T's, each about 60 feet long. The bed has a total length of 400 feet. This is a self-stressing form where the form itself is designed to take the total pre-stress force in compression and also to handle the eccentricity of the strands. Sometimes the producer may use a form that is set between bulkheads that are built right into the ground. The pre-stressing force is then resisted entirely by the bulkheads and their foundations. Next, the strands are placed in the form and extended from end to end. Crew members thread the strands through each of the dividers and then run them through the stressing plates at each end. The typical spacing of the strands is approximately two inches. This divider is a steel device that separates the individual double T units from one another. A gap of about a foot is typical between the ends of the adjacent pieces. This gap is required so the strands can be accessed and cut and that each double T can be stripped from the forms. The next step is the tensioning of the strands. In this case, we have a strand pattern with straight strands of six strands in each stem, as shown here. The strands are first tensioned to about two to five kips based on the gauge pressure reading. In this case, a mark is made on the strand after the preload is applied. The strand is then tensioned to the specified level and is measured using the gauge pressure on the hydraulic pump. The QC technician then checks the elongation against the theoretical elongation. The requirement that is the force on the gauge and the elongation must match within 5%. If that tolerance is not achieved, the reason must be established and the strand may have to be detensioned and retensioned. After the strands of this double T are all stressed, the remaining embeds are set in place. These include stem reinforcing, lifting devices that will be used to strip and handle the piece, forms for blockouts in the flange, and forms for blockouts in the stems, flange reinforcing, and flange connectors or vectors along the edges. In this case, 
One of the double T's in the bed has typical flange connectors applied along one edge and special flat plate connectors applied along the other edge to accommodate connections across an expansion joint. The form is now ready to have concrete poured, but only after a pre-pour quality control check has been made and the QC person signs off on it. This QC check can also be done by the bed superintendent and depends on the particular plant's practices. Either way, the check is critical to ensure an end product with the highest quality. There's all these things you look for, the mesh, uh, you look for anything that could be touching the stems on the bottom, like any wire ties that might have fell in there because that would develop some type of a rust spot. You check the length, you want to make sure that the damps are correct, uh, do we have the strand stripped properly. So there are a lot of critical areas that you need to verify. Concrete is mixed at the batch plant under tightly controlled conditions. The cement is supplied using tanker trucks. Here, the cement is being blown from the tanker through piping to the cement silos. When needed, aggregates are delivered to bins in the batch plant. The aggregates are stored outside of the batch plant in separate bins. In this case, an enclosed vertical bin system is utilized. During winter, in northern climates, the aggregates must be heated to get them to flow properly through the batching system and to maintain proper concrete mix temperatures. Payloaders are used to shuffle the materials to the conveyor belt. Computers are used to proportion the materials for the desired concrete mix. Cement, sand, stone, water, and admixtures are measured according to signals from the computer. After the concrete is mixed, it is discharged into a delivery device. It's imperative that the concrete mix be delivered to the form as soon as possible. These vehicles are called tuckers, and they are used to deliver the concrete to the bed in the yard. A self-consolidating concrete is being used to cast these particular double T's. With this type of concrete, vibration is not required to consolidate the concrete. However, minor controlled vibration is used in the double T stems to help remove air from the sides of the form, reducing bug holes in the stems. There are many advantages in using this type of concrete. We do use self-consolidating concrete for our double T's. Uh, we feel that it gives us a better finish. We feel that it's easier to place, it takes less labor, less strain on the labor to place that concrete. The QC department will make the necessary tests at this time, including a temperature check of the concrete. Since SCC is being used here, a spread test is done to check the concrete flow in lieu of a slump test. The spread is measured to assure conformance to the planned spread. The edges of the circle of concrete are also inspected to check for segregation. The appearance is translated to a visual stability index number. There is a check for air content. Cylinders are filled and will be used later for strength tests of the cured concrete. Back at the bed, the concrete placement continues. A vibrating screed is used to level the surface evenly. A bull float is used to finish the surface. An evaporation reducing spray is also being applied to the surface to minimize the potential for plastic shrinkage cracking. The final finish will vary depending on the use of the double T. If a cast in place topping is necessary, the surface will be made very rough so that a good bond will be achieved. If it is a roof, the finish will be relatively smooth but not necessarily perfect. In this case, the surface is broomed as these double T's are being used in a parking structure. Different patterns can be applied depending on the needs of the project. The bed is now in its curing stage. Sometimes, particularly in cold climates, the double T may be covered with tarps. In other areas, they may be open. Accelerated curing is often done using live steam or radiant heat from heaters attached to the form itself. Double T's for parking garages uh, really need to be held to a high standard. When they're assembled in a garage, they make the finished surface. There are tolerances for putting these pieces together, uh, offsets in the surfaces. All of the connections are very sensitive as well. To be executed properly, the embedments in the double T have to be placed properly. So there 
again, are a lot of critical issues that you have to be concerned with to get proper performance out of that simple double T. After 12 to 16 hours of curing, the T's are ready to be stripped. The QC department first tests the concrete to be sure it has achieved the strength required to detension the strands, typically 3,500 PSI. This is a typical test being conducted. The strands are detensioned in a specific sequence established by the QC department or the plant engineer. Here, personnel are positioned at each end of the bed and at some of the intermediate bulkhead locations. On a signal, they burn the strand at each end. After all the strands are cut and block out formwork has been removed, the T's are stripped from the form. Cables are attached to the lifting devices and each piece is removed and transported to a detailing area for any minor cosmetic touch-ups. Also at this time, the QC department does a post-pour QC check on each piece that is brought to the detailing area. When I first get back there, I go and check the length of the piece and verify that within, uh, there's a tolerance of probably a quarter inch or so. Uh, check the width, uh, we check the vectors, we check the electrical blockouts. Uh, I do a visual for any type of discoloration in the stems underneath the piece. Any type of uh, service cracks, bug holes, just do a complete visual. Any defects are noted so that repairs can be done before shipping the tea. After all the work is completed, the double T's are moved into the storage area where they are typically stacked using appropriate dunnage located near the ends. When the job site requires the T to be shipped, it is loaded on a trailer and transported to the job site. What you have just observed is the process for making one type of pre-stressed product. These other types are made using essentially the same process. Hollow core plank which are used for floor and roof components in multifamily housing, schools, hotels, and many other buildings. Inverted T-beams, which can be used in any total precast concrete build system. Columns, which are cast horizontally and then rotated in the air at the job site. They are often designed as pre-stressed components. Architectural spandrels used in office buildings and parking structures can be made using the pre-stressing process. Deck slabs and box beams, which are used primarily in short span bridge construction. Standard ash tow girders, which are used in long span bridge construction. Standard bulb tees are also used in long span bridge construction. Pre-stressed piles that support any type of building in areas that have unfavorable soil conditions. As you can see, there are many types of pre-stressed products available. The variety of products that can be pre-stressed in a long line operation is almost unlimited and is up to the imagination of the design professional. We really do encourage uh, our customers and architects and engineers uh, to get to our plants to really understand how precast concrete is made. They need an understanding of the high quality that they can get out of precast concrete as opposed to the random quality that you might get out of cast in place concrete. Well it's important that we do things as, as efficiently as, as we can and as cost effectively as we can but also as well as we can and it's, it's not only my responsibility but the responsibility of everybody here, management, labor, everybody included, to do the best job that they can to um, at the end of the day make a little bit of money but also have a customer that's very happy and will possibly want to have some return work coming back our way. You'll see a very different plant when you go uh, to, to see Lombard Architectural, but uh, that gives you an idea of the process that, uh, that you go through. One of the things that you saw there was the pre-stressing operation, and I just thought I'd show you some samples of pre-stressing steel. So, um, you know, like they mentioned, they'll, they'll pull this at three or four kips, 40, 50,000 PSI, and it does have that ability to stretch and give. They place the concrete in, the concrete then adheres to that strand. After it cures, 
they'll cut either end and then you'll have an arch or a camber in the uh, beam or uh, wall that you have and that's going to help counteract any loads that are, are placed on it. So I do... Okay. Oh, okay, you've got a... Okay, here's a typical rebar so you can see that kind of the difference, um, you know, that, that doesn't have that same ability. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just curious uh, what you do with like that piece of concrete that are like deemed unusable, like after it's already made? Uh, well, the, most of the time they try, it, you know, not to, to have it be unusable. Um, every once in a while a bridge beam or something like that will be rejected by the DOT and usually then it's just crushed and uh, used as road base or something like that. But at, by that point they've got thirty or forty thousand dollars you know, uh, for some of those bridge beams, especially invested in it. So um, they really try to do everything right or fix it um, in, in some manner. I, I was just looking at your pre-stressed wires. It's, it's seven cords in it. Is that, does that ever change? No. Um, the size might change. You might go anywhere from um, three eighths of an inch to uh, three quarters of an of an inch, um, but usually you always have the seven or not usually you always have the seven wires still okay. in it. I, All right. And I have no idea why it's seven. That's, <laughs> I'm, that's I just okay. I didn't yeah. Know it was, they add more wire. They don't add more wire. They just they they, they just make it bigger. Yeah. It's typically you have the middle one and then the others braided the around six it. wrap so around the, it. Yeah. But tell us something about the material. It's different material than the rebars. The steel itself is different. It has higher tensile strength and higher um, modulus of elasticity. So it's really different um, uh, uh, material, kind of steel, different type of steel. We cannot take the, um, the rebar and stress it like this. So. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question for you regarding the, the magic uh, formula for holding one piece, big or small. There is a formula for per piece thing, if you use your trucks, your... Um, oh, how much you can put on a truck? No, I mean, or I mean if, you, if you have a small piece or a large piece. Oh, yeah. Um, I talk about that a lot with designers because um, every time you pick up a... To get precast on a building, you have to have one key thing, and that's a crane. And uh, you have to have a crane that's going to be able to lift the largest piece of precast that you have on that job. So um, it's, that's kind of going to be the, the p crane that you're going to go with for the whole project. So then every time you pick up a piece off a truck and put it on a building, you're going to pay what we call the pick price. And the pick price is going to be for the use of that crane. So the crane doesn't really care what size it is, you're still going to have to pay, if you're in downtown Chicago, um, it might be $1,500 every time you pick up a piece and put it on a building. So if you have a 1 by 10 column cover, you've now added $150 per square foot to put it on the, on the building. So in general, larger pieces are going to be less expensive. You don't want to have a building full of small pieces of precast um, because you're going to have to pay that pick price. And it also would take longer to, to erect the building as well. So these so. two uh, advices you give, the uh, repetition, repetition of the piece, right. so you, you make many of it, right? and the, as large as possible. Of right. In general, larger is going to be less expensive, and then the repetition is going to be important. You saw how everything's cast in a long line bed. You want all of your strands lined up the same way, so piece after piece, those, the strand pattern will be the same because every piece has to be engineered for that specific project that you're doing. Every, even though you're using the same you know, notes on the keyboard, uh, you still have to engineer it or compose it in a, in a different way. So um, absolutely, you want to create as much repetition and use the same pieces over and over again. And then 
um, you know, the, the, those are going to be the two biggest factors in the cost of the precast. One is the size of the pieces. The other is uh, the amount of repetition that you have. Any other questions? I have a question regarding some tips or tricks of trade that they would do for extremely long piece, the longest piece they can have, how do they uh, transport it? Or mm -hmm. if it is tall, uh, how do they man manipulate it? Or Well, uh, with the longer pieces, like with that, well, I was talking about that bridge where it was 176 feet, you really start using the piece of precast as kind of the bed of the truck. Then you don't actually have a a truck bed, you'll have wheels on the front and then another column of wheels on the back. And then you usually, the driver will have a steering component to actually steer the back wheels from the truck or the cab of the, the truck. So, um, you know, then you'll, you'll get it to the, to the ground that way. And then also, as I mentioned, when you're erecting precast, you always want to handle it from the two ends. You never really want to handle it from the middle because it can snap. Um, so the, the precaster will do all of the engineering, <coughs> excuse me, all of the engineering for the pieces of precast because when you handle it, <coughs> excuse me, that's going to be when the most pressure is actually going to be applied to a piece of precast, not when it's in, the, in place in the building. It's all of the handling that goes into it. And so the precaster likes to do all of the engineering of his own pieces and all of the connection details. Thanks. Now, you gave us your definition for precast. What is the definition for pre-stress, pre to what? Um, the pre-stressed is what uses those um, pre-stressing steel, and uh, you've got that steel within the piece. So precast is any kind of pre-stressed Concrete is also precast concrete, but precast concrete is not necessarily pre-stressed. Uh, usually pre-stressed concrete are um, pieces that are longer, that require more uh, load placed on them, or maybe they're structural pieces. But uh, the pre-stressing is what allows you to actually use less of the concrete material uh, without uh, losing any strength or by gaining strength. By and the pre-term uh, uh, time-wise uh, reflects to the pouring of concrete, so you are uh, actually stressing the steel or the strands before... Before you place the concrete So hence the, the term pre for yeah. stressing. Yeah. Well, you can also do post-tensioning, which is... Uh, sometimes you see precast done with that. You don't see a whole lot of that done in this area. And they would create a sleeve, the precaster would create a sleeve within the, the precast product. Then it would go out to the job site and be stressed at the job site and then grouted into place there. So you could get your tension that way um, without uh, stressing it at the plant. So really it's a function of stressing it at the plant versus stressing it at the job site. What would uh, make uh, an owner or engineer or architect choose the pre-stress, pre pre-cast, other over other post-tension or other types? Um, well, one of it is what's commonly used in your, your area, um, but we usually can provide something much faster than other types of uh, products if you were casting something in place. Um, sometimes it's um, you know fire prevention or fire um, uh, fire uh, ratings are going to be important. City of Chicago loves concrete because they're real funny about fire. Um, so you know sometimes it's it's the needs of the college or the the project. Sometimes it's um, you know how fast is it going to go up. Sometimes it's what does it look like. Um, so, uh, but, you know, usually it's faster, cheaper, better. You know, the quality of the concrete is, is going to be a little bit better, too, because uh, they're using very low water cement ratio because they want to turn those beds over and start casting the beds again the next day. So, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be key. Talk about money and jobs. Okay. Uh, in a normal com uh, economic situation, not now. <laughs> in normal situation. What yeah. is the average salary? What are the jobs? Uh, 
what would our graduates do? Would be working in concreting or managers or what? Yeah, we have, uh, our, our industry does a, a few things. Um, where would they see graduates? Sometimes they're project managers. Um, where they, they come in and they'll uh, supervise the drawings and kind of after the salesman uh, gets the project in, you, you would supervise getting the drawings done, communicating with the client, making sure that the product gets to where it needs to be, um, making uh, when it needs to be there, making sure that the um, uh, materials are ordered for the um, products that you're gonna make when, when they need to happen. So um, that, that could be a, a job. Um, we also work with a lot of erectors, um, companies that erect both steel and precast, and you could be a certified uh, precast erector. And uh, again, project manager type jobs and um, you know, supervising uh, work like that. Um, marketing. You know, so I, I know a lot of people who have gone into sales and marketing with a good construction background and, uh, you know, then, then work selling the, the precast products. But usually you work your way up through, through a pre-stressing plant to, to a sales job. Those are usually some of the better paying jobs. So I think a lot of people like to kind of to work their way into those. Um, and, you know, the, some of our plants are union plants and some are not, so um, salaries really vary um, different places. But, uh, oh, there's also, um, uh, say, you saw the quality assurance uh, guy uh, doing that, and, uh, you know, sometimes they come up through the, through the ranks or sometimes they'll bring people in to do that. Um, engineering firms, uh, there's a lot of drafting that goes on uh, using uh, usually some kind of computer aided design uh, system. So uh, we, we have drafters that uh, draft all the different pieces after the engineers design them. The now if somebody is lucky to end up working uh, for a plant or uh, what is the magic number for average salary? Just I don't you know what? I have no idea. No idea. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Um so uh, I'll, I'll I'll get you another question easy. Okay. What is the relationship between the PCI that you mentioned earlier and whatever you said now? PCI, what is PCI? PCI is the Precast Pre-stressed Concrete Institute. And I work for the Illinois Wisconsin region. So, is that what you were asking? They, they inspect the plants. Or? Oh yes, they have. I'm sorry. Um, the plants uh, that are members of PCI have to be PCI certified plants, and that means that twice a year, an inspector comes to the plant and checks all of the quality assurance manuals. He makes sure that all of the equipment's calibrated. How do you store your materials? How do you train your workers? Um, how do you deal with your customers? And twice a year, he spends two days at the plant ensuring that uh, they meet all of those uh, quality. Unannounced. Issues. Unannounced. Unannounced. They just, they just yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. I think I'll stop asking here questions. Okay. But I'll ask <laughs> the audience the last question. And whoever answers this question, I'll give him a chocolate. How about that? If you can guess. What is the major of uh, Marty McIntyre? Oh, she, she, you saw how uh, professional she is in concrete and so forth. What do you think? Please, if you know it before, don't, you don't uh, qualify for that. But guess what was her major when she was undergrad? Any guess, chocolate? <laughs> Speech communication, she is good at that. Very good? Yeah, she, she is talented. <laughs> now I tell Marty, I tell Marty that she is a, a role model for a successful person. She will tell you where she started and where she is now, and um, this is a story of success, and it's inspired many students in the past to change careers drastically <laughs> and be successful wherever they are. So bl bloom wherever you are. So what so is your major? My major was uh, English literature with the emphasis in journalism. Okay, so, <laughs> so you speak English. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I got out of school and I was doing marketing for architecture firms, or for an architecture firm. And I decided I wanted to write more, so I went and worked for Roads and Bridges magazine. And then I worked for the Concrete Producer magazine. 
And then I worked for the Portland Cement Association, and now I work for PCI.